Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I, I want to do a quick intro, but uh, before, of course, it's impossible not to mention in the context of this conversation what the horrible thing that happened on Monday. So I want to remind everybody, if you want to help or donate and so on, please uh, check in the multiple websites. And if you need our help, we can direct you to where. Um, we have, and personally have, a long relation with the city of Mexico, and many of our friends are there. As you guys know, we have an initiative and a program over there. So this one is, it, touch, it touches very close. Um, so in, in, the, in the context of this conversation, it's impossible not to think about that. So, but the city of Mexico is resilient, like, like its people, so they will rebuild, and they will be back in the game as they always do. But I thought it was important to mention that because I think when we discuss architecture, so one is always important to remember how fragile every, everything is and how some of these conversations sometimes can contribute to this not necessarily sense of rebuild, but also to contribute with the sense of optimism with after tragedy like this is always necessary to keep going. Anyway. I just wanted to mention that before uh, I introduce this round panel discussion, which Mimi Ziegler will be the moderator, and I will lead, I will left to her to introduce <coughs> introduce everybody. But I just want to introduce a conversation to Casa es mi casa, which is an exhibition that is done in conjunction with the LA Forum and the Neutro House VDL, which is managed, protected, and preserved by Sarah Lawrence and her team and the school, which is a great contribution to the patrimony of the, of, of the city. But I think it's super important, this conversation between Mexico and LA-based architects as part of a, some sort of LA, LA thing. And hopefully this will become bigger and bigger as years go by. I think it's a crucial culture for all of us to keep engaging more and more. The pedigree of architecture over there and over here in so many ways, they have so many cross paths. So we are very pleased to have you, all of you guys here. And on that note, I will pass the baton to Mimi. Right. I, I've got a, oh. uh, I'm all wired for sound here. Thank you, Hernan. Um, it's really By one- By the way, Mimi doesn't need introduction here in Sire, but I'm happy to do it <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you want. No, it's okay. Uh, I'll introduce myself as one of the co-curators along with uh, Sarah Lorenzen, Andrea Dietz, and Mario Balanceros, who is, can't be with us um, the, because of the earthquake this week. Uh, various things have happened. Certain participants couldn't make it to town. Uh, certain pieces haven't arrived yet. Um, however, this has been a really resilient crew, and we do have folks who have made it uh, who are here joining us, as well as a couple of really fantastic installs already in, and one that we're just kind of biting our fingernails about. Um, hopefully, we'll have it in tomorrow. If not, it will have it up during the run of the show. Um, so I just want to sort of echo uh, what Hernan said about sort of being able to support this Mexico City and say that tomorrow night, our opening is also going to serve as a fundraiser um, to support earthquake efforts. Um, in, in Mexico and Mexico City at large. Um, so to start, um, I want to go through and maybe give a very brief introduction to each of the folks that we have with us today. Um, actually, before I do that, let me kick it to Sarah and Andrea to maybe introduce, and then I'll come back and introduce all of the panelists. That might make a better, more sense. Um, as Anand said, Sarah is the director of the VDL House. She's also an architect and a professor at Cal Poly Pomona, which is, supports the VDL. Um, among other things, uh, she has been a rock in the process of conceptualizing and sort of manifesting this project to happen. Uh, Andrea Dietz is a curator. She is an architect and a professor at Cal Poly also um, an exhibition designer, and she's got two, two shows, if not three, as part, including this one, as part of LA, LA the Pacific Standard Time LA LA. Um, one is at the Huntington right now, and the other one is at the Palm Springs Museum of Art. So if you find yourself at either of those spots, check out her work. Um, so I'm gonna let them introduce the exhibition, the concepts behind the exhibition, and the house. 
Thank you, Mimi. Wow, that's powerful. Um, so I'm going to start us off by <clears throat> talking a little bit about the conceptual framework for the project. I'm going to hand it off to Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit about the house and the conditions that the design team and the writers have worked around, and then we'll open up the floor to, um, well, the introductions and a larger discussion uh, amongst everyone here. Um, so we first conceived of this project in mid-2015. Um, between our own travels and a lot of the, the buzz and news that was coming out of Mexico at the time, um, Mexico City was becoming a, a hot spot for architecture and design. Um, and there was an increasing uh, use of design in, as a political and social tool and a hopeful mechanism for interrupting corruption and dysfunction. Um, there was a rich awakening of a rich design legacy, um, a recognition of the wealth of, modernist, of the modernist project in the city and of traditional crafts. Um, and there was a fluid embrace of both hand and machine making. Um, very unselfconscious in the interchangeability of these processes. Um, there's an emerging um, material intelligence and sensibility to all the work that we were seeing, um, an approach that mixed high and low and precious and improvisational, and we were really excited by these things. Um, at, excited because they, they seem to defy the logics of architecture and design as, as being discussed in Los Angeles at the time. Um, very much stuck in a culture of either or, post-human or social practice, analog or digital, conceptual or superficial. And we were hoping to throw a rock into that pond with this project and um, import some, some contrast um, in the ways of thinking. Um, at the same time, the Getty was in the process of releasing all of the um, award recipients for the LALA um, oh. initiative. And there were some projects about architecture and design, but none of them dealing with contemporary architecture and design. And we felt that it was very important to start to talk about um, the current relationships in the design of the built environment and the influences that were shared between our two communities. Um, so looking at both that innovation that was found in the work coming out of Mexico, um, combined with the theme of LALA, um, we were very attracted to the idea of translation as being something revolutionary, um, something that could provoke an unknown outcome, um, something that's unfamiliar. And um, we put into play all of these forces. So we've got two modernist houses, uh, the Neutra VDL here in Los Angeles, and Archivo, which is also next door to Casa Barragan in Mexico City. We've got four curators representing uh, three institutions, um, Los Angeles Forum for Architecture and Urban Design, the Neutra VDL, and Archivo. We've got three Los Angeles writers, and I'll let Mimi do those introduction in a minute, uh, three Mexico City design teams, and one Mexican photographer and one filmmaker. So we set off this series of processes wherein um, that Neutra House hosted our writers. Um, the writers then wrote letters from that house to our Mexico City design teams. Um, the Mexico City design teams are responding to those letters with installations at the Neutra VDL. Um, those then will be photographed and filmed and uh, travel to Mexico City and be installed at Archivo as an installation. Um, and so all of these sorts of moves from one step to the next is a very messy, indeterminate mix. Um, both experiences, words, forms, spaces, media, and all of those things, all of those leaps um, were pretty exciting in, in that we were trying to provoke uncertainty um, and the unknown in architecture and work with those forces. Uh, little did we know that we were really provoking uncertainty. Um, so since conceptualizing tu casa es mi casa, unpredictability um, has become an increasingly dominant force in the world stage. Um, we've seen a rise in xenophobia in, since last year's elections. Um, we've had a massive natural disaster that directly impacted us um, in this past week. And we are increasingly, as a, as a discipline, confronted with our own inadequacy in the face of these things. So we're, I'm now looking at this as, as a circumstance that architecture and design must reckon with, this idea of uncertainty and how do we incorporate that into our thinking. So in addition to its original mo motivations, uh, Tu Casa es Mi Casa is an attempt to, to build upon 
and encourage ongoing cross-border collaborations and uh, whether we like it or not, to work productively with elements that are beyond our control. <laughs> so beautiful. That was great. Beautifully done. All right, so uh, I'm tasked with speaking a little bit about the house and, um, and sort of more generally about the role of, I wanna to touch on kind of the role of a house museum as a, as a place to, to have art. Uh, so the Neutra House was, if you haven't been, it was the residence of Richard Neutra who lived there from 1932 until his death in 1970. And then in 1990, his widow, Dione Neutra, donated it to Cal Poly Pomona. Um, and really the, the primary mission of the house is as a vehicle for education, uh, to talk about architecture in general to the public, uh, and also uh, to talk about the legacy of Neutra and the tenets of modernism. Uh, and if you don't know, obviously it played, that house played a central role in Neutra's practice and in the cultural life of Los Angeles. Uh, there was hundreds of projects that Neutra designed from the house and then also lots of architects that are well known that came out of that office, including Gregory Ayn, Harwell Hamilton Harris, Rafael Soriano, um, they all began their careers there. And then a lot of, uh, Neutra really ran the, the house as a salon and had all kinds of cultural figures go through there, including uh, Flair and Cloyd Wright and Lazlo Maholi Naji and the Eameses. And really sort of like the Schindler, the King's uh, Road House, the Schindler's House at King's Road, these were really important places for people to talk about architecture. Um, Neutra's post-war work, uh, which includes VDL II, was less beholden to the international style than his early work and uh, the, the kind of tight boxes that we know of international style modernism uh, made up of you know, stucco ribbons and uh, stucco and ribbon windows gave way to buildings that were, had large expanses of glass and mirrors and that thrust outwards into the landscape. These houses were much more fluid, expressive, light, and outward looking. It's a little bit hard to compete with that. But. Um, the, formal, uh, the formal strategies that Neutra employed in these projects was tied to uh, a physiological understanding of space. He employed not knowledge of natural laws and how one perceives space, color, light, temperature in order to design environments that would alleviate the inhabitants' psychological and physical discomforts. Today, uh, VDL functions as a cultural space in addition to serving as a vehicle to talk about Neutra's work. Um, it's often referred to as a house museum, although I don't really like that term. Uh, and it's interesting that the House Museum has become one of the prevalent methods of preserving important architectural landmarks. Uh, but they also pose a difficult curatorial dilemma. How was one to maintain cultural relevance and public engagement of domestic spaces that have been stripped of their former activities, that no longer work as houses? So once a house is no longer works as a house, it must be occupied by something else. Otherwise, it'll lose its vitality. So it can become a vehicle for telling stories or as a vehicle for other types of activities, such as lectures, classes, exhibits, and performances. At VDL, faced with the challenge of activating the house, we've invited artists, such as those today, gathered here today, to generate new meanings and interpretations of the house. One of the stipulations that we have is that the art must be inextricably linked to the house, meaning that the art responds to either the architecture, to the history of the house, or to the domestic nature of the environment. Um, these collaborations sort of point to alternative preservation strategies, which move away from conservation of objects, of houses as static objects, and really talk about the importance of human occupation and transformation. The artists we've invited to engage have created works that reinforce or counter formal aspects of the building that bring back the life of the building's creator, or that cr cr critique the period in which the house was built. Um, 
So these are ways of activating and fomenting contemporary discourse uh, in addition to preserving the house. Um, for example, some of the examples you've seen up there, we've had people that are you know, performance pieces or, or exhibitions, uh, including Santiago Borja, also from Mexico City, was, who was our first invited um, artist. The artists of Tu Casa es Mi Casa, which include Frida Escobedo Studio, Pedro and Juana, and Tesontle, have all engaged the house spatially, uh, have engaged the narrative history of the house, and have, have all have a subtle critique of modernism. I think that this is a terrific ex exhibition, and I really look forward to seeing everybody and there tomorrow and seeing how you respond to these. Uh, interventions. Thanks, Sarah. And Andrea, um, for setting the stage of sort of the concepts and the sort of the place that we're dealing with. And now I, I want to introduce uh, our participants, and I want to do it sort of spatially as well. So I'm going to start with um, our, our ground floor participants. Um, uh, David Ulin, <coughs> sitting right here, is a book critic and former book editor of the Los Angeles Times. He's a 2015 Guggenheim Fellow and the author of Sidewalking, Coming to Terms with Los Angeles. And Matthew Kennedy is uh, a designer in Frida Escobedo's studio, and his work with her um, was just debuted at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. And the studio's newest exhibition opens in October, just a week away, um, at Columbia University. Uh, then, and I'll do this uh, writers and then practices. Um, Katja Televik is a writer and essayist, and she's editor at large for Elephant and a contributing editor to Mark and co author of the really great book, um, My Life as a Work of Art with Ben Eastman, Eastham. Uh, and then we have. Uh, Sayar Columns, <laughs> Ana Paula Ruiz Galindo, and Meki Rus, and they're founders of Pedro Iwana. They've created works at the 2015 Chicago Architecture Biennial at Museo Jumex, and recently they finished an installation for the renovated Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a powerful group here. Uh, and also very powerful over to, to my <laughs> left <laughs> is Arist Nigian, who's author of four novels, Bloodvine, River Big, This Angelic Land, and his most recent, Waiting for Lipschitz at Chateau Marmont, uh, which was a Los Angeles Times bestseller. He's taught humanities at SciArc from 1993 to 2005, and it's, I guess, your first time back in a while into these halls. Uh, next to him, um, is Tesontle, I will eventually get that right over the course, <laughs> uh, which was founded by Carlos Matos and Lucas Cantu in 2014. And their studio uses sculpture to bring together the disciplines of architecture, installation, art, product design. And Lucas and Carlos are also the founders of the Architecture Association's Experimental Concrete Workshop. So thank you all for being here. It's um, a really big group. Uh, I don't have a super strong plan of how we will all get our voices in, but I'm hoping that maybe some of these questions can bounce around across the table, maybe uh, create arguments between writers and... Uh, I love uh, arguments. <laughs> but, but, you know, we're all probably a little nice. You, <laughs> no, I'm not. But uh, if, maybe if we start with the idea that um, Andrea began with, which was translation. Uh, and this idea of exchange, or even like a game of telephone, which we played as we asked the writers to sort of experience the house, and then they got their, they didn't know who they were, their letter was gonna go to, and then we sort of figured out based on the letters who we thought might be the best respondent, and then we sent the letters. Um, and that, you know, so how these glitches happen and how they're either provoked or sort of smoothed over. Um, so maybe if, whoever wants to jump in on, how did you approach um, tran translating or translating between mediums? Maybe between a house and a letter, between a letter to a design idea, from a design idea to an installation, for those of you who have been spending time this week in the house sort of reckoning with it uh, and its you know, sort of climate uh, that exists. 
Any, anyone, anyone feel like they're jumping in first? Well, I had a question more because I, I guess us as architects are the ones in Mexico City where, can you hear me? Is it not? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Us in Mexico City responded to an essay and the house, so I was wondering what the writers, or <laughs> my writers, <laughs> responded to in, like, what was your first kind of thing to get? If I was thinking about the house physically, I thought about it as the spine or the skeleton. And I wanted to write about something that's uh, internal, basically, and can be draped onto a different kind of skeleton, but still have things that we all recognize. So my piece is very much about, you know, the internal organs and like a stomach that hurts or your brain that's overthinking or anxiety or fear, but it's also meant to be funny. What it amounts to is a series of passive-aggressive notes left by an architect or his family or her family throughout a kind of work of utopian residential modernism. <laughs> and uh, these passive-aggressive notes might be, you know, I think the best one is to be a prototype, one must act as a prototype. <laughs> or somebody is asked to clean the bathroom because even though they may share a set of values together, they don't have to share germs necessarily. <laughs> and I thought this could transfer to, any, this would be something we understand on a universal level. Exactly, <laughs> you know? <as> architects, <laughs> exactly, but it's how people live and it's how people irritate each other in any kind of uh, domestic setting. Which is quite different if you translate that from Los Angeles mm. to Mexico City, mm -hmm. where I think certain anxieties uh, that, that, that exist uh, don't simply translate that way. I mean, we, we have lived in LA, so we, we are familiar with uh, certain, certain uh, behaviors around how to, how to move and live in LA and um, obviously, we have been in the house uh, and and uh, made made up our uh, mind of how to interpret your text. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting because we hear that for the first time. Yeah. What? How? how that, 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 we never discussed this. We we got a text and we we uh, had to respond to the text. And uh, obviously, we very specifically tried to. Uh, locate that text in within this house as Sarah talks about it as as, as, a, as a house that is not operating as a house mm -hmm. so um, there are certain geriatric uh, <laughs> moments in there of, of, of uh, these objects that Katya describes in her text uh, basically starting to, to communicate in between each other and so um, within the house and the reflections that are constantly happening. Because it also, I, I feel the house in a way plays a role, like it's kind of playing with you at the same time. Like you could like run into the glass or like constantly <laughs> looking at yourself. <laughs> it has these very specific moments of play. Well, and plus Katia just made it more so <laughs> in that relationship. So I guess that's how we kind of process the, the text and how we dealt with these both translations. But I'm interested in this passive aggressive, like did, did people, and I will we'll let everyone else respond to that first question, but um, this idea of the brief, like was that, was like reacting to a letter or being asked to sort of take on a letter, was that, how did that sit? For, for us, as mm -hmm. responding to the letter? I, we were like, well, let's see what comes along. <laughs> no, it wasn't like a no reaction, but it was definitely, I mean, when, when you're asked to do something, it has these many layers, and, and you have to deal with like a specific yeah. requirement from the curators. Yeah. It's always kind of, oh, man, how is this going to work out? But I think like in, you were also kind of relating to the house, so you kind of just pick which, like, <laughs> which one kind of calls you more, and I felt that, well, we kind of connected. Yeah. <laughs> so it developed into a nice, translation of the work. But I don't know if that's like always <laughs> the case. We'll find out. <laughs> David, what about you? I mean, from my point of view, writing the letter first 
I hesitate to say writing anything is easy, but it's easier because uh, you get to set the uh, you get to set the terms in a certain sense. You're not I mean, you're responding to the house, or I was responding to the house, or certain conditions in my own um, life at the time that I was writing, but I wasn't um, I wasn't creating in response to another artist. I was creating the the piece that was going to be um, built off of. So um, for me, I, I like this notion of translation. I think for me, it was about getting lost. Mm -hmm. um, I try to function as much as possible as a, as a happy idiot. So I try to know as little as I can when I start. Um, and I'd never been to the VDL house. I knew uh, about Neutra and knew, knew who he was, but I um, didn't do, I, I just showed up. I didn't do any research. Um, all you students out there, I advise never doing any research. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wanted, to exp I wanted it to be experiential. And I was wrestling with certain things in the moment um, that were relevant uh, or felt relevant to me. On the one hand, um, I was lost myself. I was spending the spring when this was going on uh, living in Las Vegas, which was a city I hadn't lived in before, away from family or anybody I knew. So I was very acutely aware of isolation and being lost and question and sort of the conditionality of home. So that was kind of what I responded to most in the house was the sort of the conditionality of the physical structure um, and the notion of, con of baking conditionality into it. Um, I was also really interested in the project for a variety of reasons, including political reasons, particularly border reasons. Um, but I was thinking about the border both globally and in terms of um, U.S. policy, and also in terms of my own experience uh, leaving California, because I was because I was coming back and forth periodically. So I was, and I was very aware of the notion of California as somehow distinct from the rest of the United States, which may be a wishful thinking on my part, but I continue to adhere to that wish. Um, and so I was really aware of leaving home in the sense of when I would cross the border into Nevada, um, about 40, 40 or so miles west of Las Vegas, I was really aware of leaving home, of moving into um, what felt to me like um, alien territory in some sense. So I was interested in that question of dislocation. I was interested in that notion of, of borders, physical or otherwise. I was interested in writing out of my own loneliness and my own discomfort. And so those things, and letters also are immensely intimate as a form. Um, as our houses. And so I was really interested in that idea of thinking about communicating one-to-one, -one, although it was also a challenge to be communicating one-to-one -one when I didn't know who my recipient was. Um, that freed me up to focus um, more on kind of the questions I guess I wanted to ask rather than directing them in a certain way. So I'm curious about the, the more restrictive experience of getting the letter and having to respond to it. But the, so. I'll do my best. Uh, so first of all, I'm in a, a, a position where I need to do my best to convey like Frida's response to your letter and then I'll explain our process. So first of all, I want to say uh, the letter I think was, this is uh, the first time I've had the chance to even look at the other ones since the, the program for the exhibition has been printed, but what I love about this letter is I have a distinct feeling that you were like in a car when you wrote it. Like <laughs> this is like a letter that was uh, conceived of while driving. Uh, so you say you're in Nevada, but yeah, there's something very like, uh, like you can sense the distance from when you were actually in the house and when you're reflecting back on what that experience was uh, nine days previously. Um, and so the way that uh, our response to it came about, I think it's, it's interesting because this is sort of an incredibly wide ranging series of reactions. Uh, you, you, you speak alternately about like what you're going through in that moment in Nevada and how that relates to, you know, you're using that to reflect on what Neutra's experience must have been as an emigre to the United States, uh, sort of building an identity that was simultaneously like uber American and on the other hand still tied back to uh, where he had come from. He, he brought it with him and then he convinced the rest of us that this was actually like the most modern, uh, sorry, the most American architecture that there could have been. Um, and, and the way I think we responded to this was, uh, you know, we processed the letter for a while and then, uh, you know, Frida also came to Los Angeles some months ago and spent some days in the house and I think it was a matter of figuring out which things you had addressed resonated with her experience of the house as well. Um, 
And so here I am over here with a new copy of the program, like underlining the things for probably the fifth or sixth time, like this, 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 and this. But uh, one, some of the things we thought were most interesting that you spoke about were like these ideas of like uh, recursion and reflection uh, of surfaces. And you know, there's a lot of ways to read into that without hopefully becoming too metaphorical. Uh, you also sort of, as I said already, uh, you you referenced his status as somebody who had come to this country from another place. And from what you're saying now, obviously, that also plays into this discussion about Mexico and the United States and this sort of back and forth and, and cultural reciprocity and, and current political issues as well. Um, and so in the end, we tried to distill that into like the simplest possible gesture. And, and we hope that like the video house itself, there's actually uh, layers to that and w different ways of interpreting that. Um, that's it. Uh, and we'll, I'll think about a little more to say as we move the conversation forward. <laughs> cool. Uh, and looking over at this side of the table, <laughs> translation. Well, I got to say, when I got this project, I thought this is kind of one of those strange conceptual things that only people in the academy can dream up, really. <laughs> really, honestly. A writer, you know, writes a letter to someone they don't even know, and then they're supposed to take this letter, and they're supposed to do something with the VDL house. I don't know, I mean, it sounded to me pretty weird. Honestly. We did have four curators in there. And whatever. You know, it's a weird project. One of those things that only academics could dream of, you know, in their off hours. But, but as it turns out, it's pretty damn interesting. And when I began to write it, I was thinking of, I wasn't thinking of these guys. Well, this, this guy, his partner, unfortunately, is left behind in, at the house itself. But I was thinking, you know, I'm... I, I want to really even, this is pretty fascinating that I am communicating now something to someone, you know, who's my friend. This is how I respond to them, though I never met the people. So I had to really use my powers, imaginative powers, to get there. What I wrote, I'll just tell you, I won't explain it, I'll just tell you what it was. Given our current environment, I decided I'd write a letter where ICE, under the Trump administration, decides to, to, to throw 12,000 agents into the city of Los Angeles and begin arresting first on the streets, for, then at businesses, and then from their own homes, all undocumented immigrants, illegal immigrants, illegal, there's so many words for this, you can't even get it right. But anyway, you know what I'm talking about. So they start to arrest them, and they arrest them en masse. So many people arrested that restaurants have to shut down, car washes have to shut down, all the nannies disappear from all these households. People are now taking Ativan like they eat M&Ms. They're so depressed and anxious. They, the whole city is now like falling apart, right? As would be the case. So all these fashionable and not so fashionable types in Los Angeles rise in protest. They close down the entire city. All of downtown is closed down. First, they, uh, they march in protest, you know, down the 101 and the 10 and and then they closed down the city streets themselves. The city has frozen its tracks as a way to freeze out ice. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> so this is a happy story. <laughs> but there are other people who want what I call a full-on meltdown. Soon, at the fourth day of the protests, buildings around LA begin to be set on fire in a way that is more calculated than random. And before long, the entire city is going up in flames. 
the narrator, myself, is visiting Sarah and David <laughs> that evening just to enjoy themselves himself at the house. And now he's watching the city being torn down by flames as he watches from the rooftop of the Neutra house. <coughs> That's the, you know, it gets a little bit, I'm a writer, I'm a novelist. It gets colorful in ways that I can't quite describe. And hopefully you find colorful. But I thought this was something that was, you know, about the moment, about the possibility of the future, and also took into account what we've come through. Because in 1992, LA also went through a riot that burnt down a fairly significant number of buildings and really messed up the lives of a lot of people. So I was looking back to those events. And so these guys were charged with the task of responding to this story. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so, so the way we responded to, to a text uh, this project has, has many layers to it, so, so in a way we, we grasped on, on concepts uh, that related to what, we're, what we were working on or thinking on at the, at the moment we received it. The text was very, very touching and, and, and in a way really uh, a really interesting narrative, kind of dark, uh, which we liked. And uh, we were currently working in Mexico City in this uh, abandoned modernist house from the 50s. Uh, that they didn't have the same uh, fortune as the BDL house to survive, you know, time. Uh, and it, it's actually, it was demolished last month. So, so we got this, this place to work there for, for almost a year. And we started also uh, tearing down parts of the house and taking them back to the studio and, and just fantasizing about uh, the way that house worked and, and stuff. So in a way, this text uh, for us questioned a lot the values of, of modernism. And, uh, and there's an obvious relation between uh, Mexican and, and, and Californian uh, modernism because I guess one of the main reasons would be uh, the climate. The, uh, maybe, maybe in Mexico we have a lot more rain than, than in LA, but we also have this, this, this temperature that allows uh, thin, thin uh, glass walls and, and, and light architecture. Uh, but in a way, uh, the text questioned with, with all of these riots the, the bare principles of, of modernism. So, so uh, in a way, it related to that uh, thing we were living with, uh, with the modernist house in, in El Pedregal. And uh, uh, so, so we were also studying this, this Guatemalan artist called Carlos Merida. Uh, which worked almost his whole life in, in Mexico and uh, worked a lot uh, around uh, Mexican uh, uh, pre-Hispanic themes. And in 1950, he, he worked along uh, architect Mario Pani in a really big uh, project, uh, housing project uh, buildings in, uh, that, that were inaugurated in, in 1952. And, um, and uh, uh, Tuesday, 32 years ago, it fell down in the 1985 earthquake. And uh, so, so when we were thinking of the project, uh, the earthquake hadn't happened, no? the one from, from Tuesday. But, but in a way, we took it as, as an ana analogy of, of like modernism falling down or modernism uh, serving its purpose, in a way. And, uh, Relating to Richard Neutra of, of, of these houses, really transparent houses, where you can see the living room and the people cooking in, in the house, and and uh, and right now maybe maybe that's more complex. No, people want tall walls, uh, alarm systems, and and uh, another type of protective architecture. So so in a way, uh, we got the the glass pavilion on top of the house, which we really like the space. Uh, so we decided to turn that into like a protective bunker and uh, to board up the whole window facades. 
Uh, but we took the Merida murals that had fallen down from the, in the earthquake and, uh, and decided uh, that, that it could be nice to, to give it a, like a second life, uh, a second life as a, as a barricade to, to close down a modernist house in, in California. And in a way, uh, I, I guess another difference between the, the, the Mexican modernism that you can, you can see a lot of examples in the city is this plastic integration, which was a term that Carlos Merida coined, uh, which was this uh, like, yeah, like plastic uh, interventions in architecture that, that, that rather than just a painted mural, uh, more of a, like an integrated uh, thing with architecture. So, so when we saw the house, it, it just, we had this image of, of, of having one of these murals you can find in UNAM, which is the, the Mexican uh, university, uh, which is full of these examples of, of, of murals integrated to, to functionalist architecture. Uh, so yeah, we took this as an excuse, and, and we find, we've been finding a lot of layers to it. And, and, and yeah, and the, the thing that happened on Tuesday was really, breathtaking and, and actually our mural is not going to be exhibited uh, tomorrow because it's, it, it got stopped by, uh, the, the airport was closed and it, and it didn't have a chance to fly. The, the day it was supposed to fly was the, the day of the earthquake. And uh, it, it uh, got here yesterday but it got stopped by customs and yeah. So, so maybe uh, if you go tomorrow you're not going to see it but you will see it maybe next week or, or whenever you pass by. Super Lake Boulevard and, and, and see the house, uh, you, you, you will actually be able to see it from the outside. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess we've been talking about like modernism as the connective tissue between uh, Mexico and Los Angeles, but I, I guess maybe can we think about identifying sort of other, other points of connectivity uh, that uh, maybe, you know, it's, it's a funny thing. It's like we ident we really want, as curators, we really wanted to sort of highlight the design scene in Mexico and sort of, you know, sort of work with people that had these kinds of practices that were certainly material based. Um, uh, and we're going to go through a kind of, uh, I don't know, an education of Los Angeles in a certain way that we wanted to sort of exhibit these works. Um, and, and it sort of means something different right now to talk about like the Mexico City design scene after a big crisis. But I mean, can we reflect a little bit on sort of what's going on in, in sort of the architecture in Mexico and how those kinds of exchanges conte in contemporary terms are happening? Is, is, the, is there a value in sort of talking about that right now? <laughs> I guess it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, how do you read it? I, I will be interested in knowing why maybe you chose these three particular studios. We obviously kind of work in similar mediums or it's really hard to kind of describe your own practice in, in, in this uh, way of like what's happening in Mexico City, so many different things. <laughs> I'm just interested in like what would be your approach of like recognizing this, uh, or what are you like, what, what was your interest on in this Mexico City scene I mean, apart from modernism? That we I mean, I think for, I don't want to speak fully for all of it, but I think one of the things that we were looking for were practices that, um, that could both work conceptually and materially, that their ideas were not just sort of uh, abstracted sort of diagrams, but, ne but instead were sort of trying to work out these questions through the act of making, um, and whether that making is installation or building or uh, some combination of in between seemed like a good fit for the, the house itself and the kinds of requirements that the house sort of puts on designers who try to operate within it. I don't know, Andrea, Sarah, what do you, within that? I mean, I was watching a lot of things that were happening in Tijuana more than I was watching things in Mexico City, but um, the, the things that were exciting to me when we picked up this project was the kind of um, improvisational, um, anything goes kind of attitude that happened with Mexico City or with Mexican design. And there was a sort of um, 
freedom in it that was lacking in a lot of the work that I was seeing here. And there was a, a kind of lack of fear as well in terms of just like we're gonna do it and see what happens and um, playing with like all of the technology and all of the craft and all of these things that just happened to be at your disposal. Um, and it, it was like the shackles had come off in a certain way and um, it was pretty exciting. So that, that was um, what drew us to the, or me to the idea of looking at, at Mexican architects and designers. Um, and then when we went to look for the project specifically, we were, I, we were looking for teams that actually embodied those ideals. I think there was also something to that, that um, the, the freedom, I think LA is often for architects said to be like, you can do anything here. Uh -huh. um, and I think at certain periods in the history that you were able to, um, and I think that that had, you know, various times has been more true than others. And so there was maybe, without sounding nostalgic, um, a certain sort of reflection of a period of Los Angeles um, that was maybe going on in Mexico City. I mean, I certainly think that every time that the city inspires you in different ways, maybe you're not doing it consciously, and being in Mexico City, I mean, we lived in LA for seven years, and then moving to Mexico City, definitely the way that you work changes, maybe because of the proximity of certain materials or the ability that you have to work one-on-one, uh, -on -one <laughs> or just, uh, I guess uh, in Mexico the practice is much more directed at, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a certain space of really just doing it and like playing with material, but I think we all have very different approaches towards materiality, I mean, in all the practices, and I think that's something that will show in the house, which I think is very nice, uh, how we decide to approach materiality in different ways. We did something much more schizophrenic, I guess, relating to our <laughs> I think it's Katya's fault. <laughs> so, but it was more about just uh, look, looking towards something that we could transform in time. And well, that's, I, I guess, the way it's, that we approach it. But I, well, I don't know. That's what I have to say. <laughs> I, know, I think it might help. <clears throat> the audience a little bit if you explain what the what, oh, what the, we did what you did because it's you a little bit hard to <laughs> <laughs> what did we do okay so we first we went to the house which was also interesting before we even got the letter or essay <laughs> I'm not sure if to call it a letter is correct but the fragments the fragments the, <laughs> the yes. passive aggressive notes <laughs> So first you're responding to this environment. And we stayed in the house, which is actually also super nice to experience a couple of days in this house and just looking at the way that it lives through the day. And then we got the, the and when we were in the, no wait, we had already the text. Yeah, yeah. I said it wrong, completely. <laughs> so we read this text and we were thinking about domesticity and the way that this, text was addressing those moments that happen in this modern house, which also has this history of 60 people living in it, and it was just a very active social working environment. And uh, we wanted to find a material that could both reflect and be part of, I'm sorry, <laughs> of a domestic environment. So we went to the supermarket and got aluminum foil and that's how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> and then the rest you will see tomorrow. If you go to the, or you wanted to tell more? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, actually the part, this was, so it all started with the Mi Casa Es Tu Casa. So once we were back in Mexico, we, were, we need to bring something from Mexico City to the BDL house. And this kind of connects a little bit towards Lucas and Mato's exhibition because of course modernism in Mexico cannot be like experience without the prehistoric murals and all the reliefs and everything. Like it was something that it really took on and it was very patriotic as well. It was very like, it was a pride in that kind of thing. So we took uh, patterns from different uh, modern buildings and modern Which structures. Which we're seeing up here. Which are right? the ones that you're looking at. 
And that's trying to represent also the reflection of aluminum foil, which is a very special, weird thing that... But there, there, there is some, some sort of uh, archival or... or uh, um, it, there's a process of, of kind of uh, reviving these patterns and, and actually dressing the house in, in, into a different state. So the, 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 there are obviously uh, self-containing patterns inside of the house of all sorts of materials that Roger was really interested in. And I think his use was uh, very peculiar because I, very LA in a way because he 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 he, he used uh, really cheap stuff and uh, kind of built his own house all of that and and uh, but 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 huh because of his economics but also because of uh, like I don't know if he was a cheap guy but um, <laughs> it, it it kind of uh, you know it's like obsessively detailing everything to a point that it butts up perfectly and becomes about all these planes. And we, we said it was like, okay, let's confront him with something that, that within a modern process of Mexico is like much, has much more depth, much more structure, much more uh, color, much more yeah, pattern. And um, superimpose that and, and at the same time uh, considering Katya's text as as this weirdly schizophrenic um, <laughs> thing that operates on top of of uh, the furniture of the house, uh, we we basically so I'm, that's how we read it. So th th there are all these vignettes of uh, notes left around the house, um, and and they they represent a certain uh, mode of habitation but there's nobody in the house mm -hmm. you know it's like it's 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 a museum nobody lives in there so empty, yeah. what what happens at at a moment that that, that nothing is going on like <clears throat> who communicates within that and what happens with this text so uh, it becomes all about uh, kind of these notions of domesticity which is the furniture and the objects and so, so we made the house disappear. We, we basically <laughs> tried to decompose uh, the house and, and, and kind of... Uh, frame the objects. Yeah, frame the objects and, and uh, then, then uh, insert other things that actually start communicating in between themselves. So um, they will, there will be objects reintroduce with the text other. and I don't know. It's a little convoluted, sorry, but um, <laughs> we, we, we are still doing this, so uh, we, we have to... There's layers to yeah. it. <laughs> Maybe I can throw in a piece of Katja's text into the mix so that we can sort of hear it. Um, I won't do as good a job of reading as the sound uh, piece that will also be accompanying it, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, a typed memo placed on top of the radio. Children. In the horror stories you enjoy, a home often haunts a family with various unresolved issues from the past. Remember that this is fiction. In your reality, only a family could haunt a home and weigh down perfectly healthy construction with its tiresome worries and clutter. Exclamation point. So you guys had to really wrestle with something that was kind of coming from various other sort of languages and so translating something like that into an architectural form. You can tell how they have to wrestle with these well, <laughs> condi I, I conditions of language to options. materiality. We had two options. We either just like follow it through, <laughs> like, <laughs> like if it was almost a dictation, like we just had to do it like exactly as it was. Or we tried to, obviously, as we did, to find an abstraction to it and just play along with it. And we loved the fact that it had humor. So we were hoping to catch a bit of it's hard to make humorous architecture, <laughs> but we definitely try to go there. So we hope that it accomplishes a bit of that. But, and David, your, your text, I'm going to do a, a little sna snippet of it. We'll see how that comes out. Um, and, and David writes, and yet we all exist now in alien landscapes, alienated landscapes. We are all the alien within. We all occupy a kind of existential state waiting as we must for what will happen next. Such a condition is shocking most perhaps, not for being shocking at all. This is the condition of living, isn't it? 
not knowing when the other shoe will drop or when it does, how far or how hard or how fast it will fall. <laughs> you can really bring the whole thing down. I know. I'm just like, we were laughing with humor a minute ago, but now we're alienated. Right, but, but right. Humor was of, not my problem. <laughs> but it, it brought up a sense of re reflection and nostalgia, I think, which uh, when we were talking to Frida about it when she was at the house, she was finding in the reflections in the architecture itself, in the mirrors, sort of things always sort of looking back at you and back in time and back and back and forth in space. And I think the piece, um, which maybe Matthew, do you want to describe a second for what it is? Yeah, sure. I suppose I didn't do that before. Uh, so the way we reacted to this, as I said, we tried to find the simplest gesture possible and, and do that. So we found that within the house itself, uh, throughout the house, well, the second one, because you already mentioned that in the video yeah, house yeah. one, Actually, it was, it was a lot less glass surfaces. It was a lot more closed. It was a lot more uh, inward looking. And of course, the VDL house too is this sort of, you know, I'm not gonna make the generalization that like every great modern architect had their glass house, but I mean, this is about, the, I mean, the VDL house too, he, he took that turn into that language and created this sort of like panoramic experience of the city. We are never quite sure. I think you say this in, in here. Uh, at times it's difficult to know if you're looking in or out uh, to the city on the other side or of the glass or back at yourself. And, um, and throughout the house, Neutra uses mirrors and uses glass to uh, like continue walls and create this sense of sort of infinite panorama of what is in fact a small enclosed room. And so we wanted to play with that language. So essentially what we've done is on the ground floor, we've created a, a mirrored partition uh, to sort of, I think this is the only place in the house where it's occurring at 45 degrees instead of 90 degrees. And so as a result, what actually happens is uh, the facade on the front of the house uh, turns 90 degrees and you have a room. Uh, you, you have the, the curtains, you know, the sort of iconic curtains just turn the corner and continue <coughs> past this wall to you know, God knows where. And, uh, and then on the other side, we've just sort of exposed the frame that's keeping the mirrors up and sort of like shown our hand. Uh, and at first we were considering mirroring it on both sides until we realized that we are not that interested in subterfuge. So, um, and so that's what we've done. And, and another thing you pointed out was this sort of relationship between the original house and the second house and the way that it evolved and the way that his ideas about domesticity had evolved. Um, and you use this, this, you know, something well we took from your text also is you use this example of like a book uh, that had survived the fire and we're actually here referring to a book by Neutra. Um, and I, I, I would be lying if I said I could pronounce the German name uh, because we're talking about the German edition, but they would later print it in English and change the name to uh, uh, survival through design. Did I get that right? Survival through design. Uh, but the actual translation of the original is something closer to if we want to continue, which is the name of our piece. And we thought that uh, that was a really beautiful phrase that sort of tied into many different ideas of what we're discussing here. Uh, and so that book will be uh, reflected back at itself on a table, which is reflected back at itself <laughs> in a room that's reflected back at itself. <laughs> But David, and about were you, when sitting in the house, feeling that the house provoked these kinds of reflections and self-reflections in you? Well, I mean, I'm I'm really interested in the present. Yeah. And so, I mean, part of the excerpt that you read, it's partly a, it is a reflection. This is written in early, well, written in late February. So it's partly a reflection of. Um, of just sort of broad-based uncertainties, right? Broad-based political uncertainties, um, waiting to see what it, what other shoe is going, well, not only waiting to see how the other shoe is gonna drop, but actually waiting to see what the other shoe is going to be first, and then seeing how it's gonna drop. And, um, and in some ways, it's a reflection on sort of sanity, which I think is reliant on remaining in the present and not spending too much time or not spending too much time in the past, although building that present out of the past, that was one of the things that really interested me about the house was that it was built on the footprint of the, uh, of the first house, which 
um, which was destroyed, and, um, and that there were certain similarities and certain differences. It was not an attempt to recreate the, the first house. It was an attempt to sort of, it was an evolutionary model. So that interested me, but also, you know, to be frank and, um, and wholly autobiographical, in late February when I was writing this, I was really just spending a lot of time trying to keep my head on my shoulders um, in terms of political life. And so that sense of, again, I, don't, I didn't want to write a political letter, but I wanted the politics, especially because of that um, American-Mexican collaboration to be, if not front and center, then sort of center. Um, it felt like we were in a situation that we, it hadn't gelled or solidified in any way. We didn't know what was going to be happening. And there was all sorts of conjecture floating around. If you're, um, if you're, if you're, per, if you're wound the way I am, that conjecture only makes you um, crazier, more neurotic. And so I was really interested in the idea of how staying in the present keeps our feet on the ground in the house seemed to me to provoke that or encourage that. Mm -hmm. Um, by virtue, again, of partly of its own conditionality, partly of those reflective surfaces. I was also really interested in the water, right, in the use of water, particularly on the, the roof and as another kind of reflective surface. And uh, again, as we were just talking about, those reflective surfaces both as reflections but also potentially as portals, um, depending on, not only depending on what they reflect, but depending on what we're actually looking at. So the viewer or the resident or the participant or the thinker or whatever has, um, plays a, a, a significant determining role because how, what we see when we look out, what we're looking for, or what we're looking at um, is, is, is both utterly subjective but utterly essential. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's interesting to go from the present, which is your, your piece, to maybe a very dark or dystopic future, which is your piece, right? Like it's a near future, it, it is, it's just ahead of us, just out of reach. Um, since I've read little bits of each of them, I don't know, read, uh, do it, unless you want to read it yourself. But I'll, I'll, I'll you give it a try. I'll do a try. You do such a good job. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, gunshot and sirens cut through our sleep like shrapnel. And so we slept that night in fits and starts, only to discover when we woke that some of our most revered architecture projects, mostly downtown, were reduced to clinkers. Saddest and most ironic of all, Our Lady of Angels was now Our Lady of the Ashes. Our eternal faith has turned into our infernal. In defiance of the feds, we'd raised up a so-called sanctuary city only in the end to raise it. So maybe we could talk about like the role of dystopia uh, in Los Angeles, but also as a, as a productive tool for sort of thinking about architecture. That's a good question. <laughs> you answer it. <laughs> <coughs> no, honestly. Can you ask for water? <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, so I guess uh, talking about the, the connections between our cost and architectures or cost and modernisms, uh, there's also this, this sense of, of vision or, or of really visionary architecture, really, uh, yeah, like uh, taking the, like the, the human values or the modernist values to the edge, as we had examples in, in Mexico and, and, and in, in LA. But, but, but like an, in current times, I guess, they're being questioned a lot and, and, and obviously, I have a sense that they've served their purposes, both of them, no? And uh, so, so in a way, these this political issues that, that we're living in the present times just conf confirm that in a way. And uh, in a way, your text for us was, was this kind of, uh, you know, the city burning down, you know, like that's like a really a big symbol to to maybe like like things changed or things things have to change in 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 this in these approaches to from designers to to build or to to design or to to provoke. So in a way, I don't know. Like uh, we had those times like of really uh, projecting uh, 
a futuristic dream that that portrayed us as, as modern man and 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 with these modern ideals that that I don't know like right now they they they're, they're, there's like they're like a they're like, like a dream or like a vintage fantasy or oh. in a way so so yeah I don't know. You most are students out here. Do you realize the promise of modernity, not just as an architectural movement, which is one thing, but as a philosophical, social, cultural movement, is the foundation for almost everything we enjoy in our culture? It is a very rare thing to achieve in cultures. Um, most cultures don't come close, and only a few approach it. And so we are living with great luxury in this moment. That is, in my opinion, um, very near collapse. And it's not just happening in America, it's happening everywhere. We may very well descend into a kind of dark ages in the near future that will take us quite by surprise because we will be looking at our iPhones and mesmerized by our screens as it's happening around us. It's a disaster kind of approaching us, encroaching upon us, and um, um, a potential disaster. But I'd say at this point, 50-50. Um, and so it's, excuse me? No, I was saying, isn't it always 50-50? Are you? Uh, no, I think that, I don't think so. I think, I think that something definite has changed. Uh, we've gone through dark times, but there was always a resilience and hope that the future held something for us. I think very many people have a hard time even thinking of a future that is not sci-fi. So I think that that was animating my um, essay. Um, animating my essay, and it, it's something that was the genius of this project, in my opinion. Most of you are sitting there in front of your computer screens thinking, what's more beautiful than I did last? What's more uh, controversial than what the guy next to me is doing? What's more provocative and is gonna get me you know, nods at the next uh, studio review? But what I think the genius of what you guys did is you actually had us, required us, made us respond to each other's human beings with visions and dreams, with material, not just ideas. And I think that that is a, um, there's something in that um, idea that we need to learn from. Um, it's not just a matter of translation, it's a matter of what real empathy is, which is seeing into the heart and the mind of something and creating a material response from it. You know, fixing something or responding to it. So I think that's what I want to provoke with you guys. You know, and I'm, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I don't know what it looks like. I know it's a bunker that has some element of hope in it, which seems to me to be a pretty, you know, probably pretty good response to my, my piece. I think um, I want to read a little text that Mario Ballesteros wrote um, just to bring him into the conversation. A design that is not just critical of conditions and circumstances, but also self-critical. <clears throat> A creative community that thrives despite its fragmentation and its uneasy conditions, that pushes ahead without the stuffy constraints of institutional or stylistic coherence to bear it down. A profession that is open, generous, and sharp instead of elitist, superficial, and complacent. That's my wish list for 2018. Okay. I think that might be a great place to leave it. Um, if the, should we ask for questions? If, if, if there's burning questions, let us know. All right. In which case, oh wait, Joe. Sorry. What do you see there, Joe? There's a there's a mic coming to you. Maybe it's a quick one, and maybe to Andrea. It's striking to me how many of the projects, in one way or another, come to the come to the question. 
to Andrea, it's striking to me how many of the projects come to the question of walls in one way or another. The reflective wall, the, bear, the, the wall that's being assembled of the, of the bas relief being imported. I even think as I was looking at the graphics spinning through this cycle that the continuous line and repetition in plan, they too almost read uh, it with a kind of mur a kind of mural logic. And I, I guess I was wondering if, if in curating the show, I think there's a wonderfully subtle, kind of modest uh, um, trend, uh, or, uh, um, not transgressive, but uh, I, I, there's. There's a sort of undertow to the to reclaiming the wall, and basically, you know, a lot of this seems premised on the idea that Latin America Latin America has produced better walls for longer than North America has, <laughs> and that they can be repurposed in a variety of ways that aren't simply that aren't simply barriers. I guess, well, I'm wondering if the discussion of walls came up as a as a as a general theme, and I'd like to ask one question of the reflective wall in particular. The, the reflective wall brings up uh, a pe well, there are a variety of reflective walls that have happened over the years, but one that, one that stuck with me was a, a wedged reflection that Daniel Buren built in the Guggenheim Rotunda about 10, 15, 15 years ago, which had the effect of, of reflecting the spiral of that museum into a modernist, into a kind of oddly modernist banded floor. And I, I just, I, I wanted to ask you about Kind of what you, how you, how you saw the results of that move in the building, and ha have you had time to kind of assess what it what it yielded? Well, I've been assessing it for maybe four hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's all come together very quickly. Um, I'm not familiar with the project at the Guggenheim. Uh, I will look it up. Um, I, you know, I feel like a lot of at least my thinking about our project uh, has really developed in the last few days since being here and the discussions that all of the designers participating uh, have been able to have. And obviously, they've also touched on current events. And, um, and I don't think that walls are <laughs> have actually been central. Of course, I know why that might be the case. But um, maybe you're, you're right. And maybe it is something that's sort of like I think uh, we're in a moment where it's easy to see something and then keep seeing it over and over again as a sort of as a sort of neurotic tick, and perhaps that's what I'm bringing <laughs> to this. But it is it's striking to me how many how many figures or how many projects, even at a certain point, the cursive continuity of, of the writing that went into this. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, yeah. I mean, walls. I don't think walls were part of the brief, but but I think maybe in, in, to maybe use a Katya. Uh, is um, it, it, there's a haunting that has now emerged from the projects that are about walls. I think maybe that's what you're seeing. But it wasn't, I don't think there was any prescription for walls. No, um, if anything, it was, um, there was an opportunity, and some of the folks have used this to um, take objects from the Archivo collection uh, and bring those with us, uh, with them to here, so that there was this exchange of object. Um, and I think, it's in, in a way, the wall has become sort of maybe that symbol. And, and maybe it's just one of those things that's in our psyche, right? Border walls is, now once you see it once, yeah, you see it uh, a thousand times. I, it's a simple no, more, more than anything. It, it was not an explicit, but I, I, I'm fascinated by it. It definitely does seem to be some sort of something rising up. Um, this isn't directly tied to that, but it came up in my thoughts as as we were discussing in that I, I'm I keep trying to be optimistic in all of these things, and um, one of the reasons that I was even drawn to the the Mexican condition is that a lot of the um, design excitement and innovation was actually coming out at, at least in Tijuana of a kind of um, return from the dead. Um, the city had obviously been um, going through a long period of uh, violence and conditions there and at a certain point everyone just said we're done with this and it was out of that that this kind of energy and excitement came and um, I, I think that to, to both 
Eris and um, Lucas is kind of quandary. It's, it's like the dystopic actually was the generative force in that case. Um, and a wall is certainly in the center of that, but it's, it's exciting to me that at a certain point, humans just say, all right, we're done. I think you are all very depressed. <laughs> I think we are much more optimistic down there. You should come. <laughs> so, yeah. I think uh, for many, for the projects that we have sort of maybe struggled a little bit to describe, uh, frustratingly perhaps for you guys, um, that it will all be solved if you come join us at 6 o'clock tomorrow evening at the Neutra VDL. It's off next to the Silver Lake uh, Meadow. Um, there will be drinks, there will be an opportunity to donate to help support relief efforts, and uh, there will be lots of conversation and pieces for you to look at. So thank you all very much. Thank, thank the whole panel. Thank you. Thank you.